All right, welcome to the pilot episode of Hail to the King podcast. Um, I'm Mark, this is Magnus, Hello. and this is going to be our pilot episode. We're super jazzed, excited for you guys to listen to it. Um, in this pilot episode, we it was our first recording, and we did uh, Pet Cemetery. We figured that was a popular one enough. Mo- most people are familiar with the story, whether through the reading the book or seeing the movie. A new movie's coming out, and we just figured this would be a good one to start with. Um, we just kind of stop recording at a certain point, and we never really get to a conclusion towards the end of the episode. And uh, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that this was kind of like a, a rough draft of what we wanted the podcast to become, you know, what our show was going to be. Um, and we want to come back to this book, um, you know, once we've kind of established some uh, groundwork for what we want this podcast to be. We do plan on coming back. All right, before we get started, just wanted to give a shout out to Carlos Rivera. Uh, he's a buddy of mine. He did the intro and kind of exit. ending exit music for for our podcast. And ooh, I hope you hear that lightning or that thunder. Damn. Yeah, <laughs> you don't hear lightning. <laughs> Anyways, there's a cool storm going on outside. But yeah, shout out to Carlos Rivera. Uh, check him out. He's awesome. And hope you guys enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Hail to the King podcast. So we are doing Pet Cemetery for our first one. Awesome book. Very awesome good. book. And so just to get started, we're going to do like a little, what, Reader's Digest summary of the book. And again, spoilers galore. If you haven't read it, you know, highly recommend reading it or watching the movie. But if you don't mind spoilers, jump in with us. So, kind of comes in three parts. Part one, you are introduced to Lewis Creed and his family. And they are just moving to uh, Ludlow, Maine. And he is going to be a doctor, the kind of the head, head physician at a just local university. And he, he moves there. He finds out that, you know, through his neighbor... That there is a pet cemetery, essentially in his backyard, just on his on his plot of land, and kids have been burying their pets there. It's it's kind of cute because it's spelled if you if you haven't seen you know how they spell it. It's instead of the regular spelling, it's pet cemetery S E M A T A R Y. So it's like a kid would spell it. Um, and so that it's, that's really part one is just the introduction of the pet cemetery, what it is. And then you kind of find out in part two, the annex to the pet cemetery, the Micmac burying, burying grounds, which, uh, Judd Crandall, the neighbor who introduces Lewis to pet cemetery, he takes him to the Micmac burying grounds because... Lewis's daughter's cat dies, and the cat's name is Church. Uh, what? Winston Churchill? Winston Churchill. Yeah, that's the full name. Name of the cat. Uh, the cat dies while, you know, over Thanksgiving, and Judd really wants to help help Lewis out. He feels compelled to help Lewis out. Yeah. Uh, to uh, soften the blow to his daughter, because it's his daughter's cat, and... Uh, she may or may not be ready to deal with death at her age and that's that's a huge that's a huge thing a theme in the book is is death and the effects it have has on different people so they go there they bury the cat uh, in this micmac burying ground and the cat comes back the next day but it's not whole it's kind of broken like its mind is, is broken slightly you know, retarded, a little slower. So you find that out. And then in part three, kind of the climax, 
um, Gage, Lewis's Lewis's little youngest boy, uh, Gage ends up getting hit by a semi, and Lewis just he knows about the the burying grounds, and he again, like Magda said, he's compelled, um, really compelled to take his boy and bury him up there, and all hell breaks loose, and it's it's it makes things worse and it's just a down downward spiral from there and until you know the climax gage ends up killing judd crandall killing lewis creed's wife rachel and then lewis ends up killing gage and the cat reburying his wife or burying his wife in the micmac burying grounds and then with the hopes of uh that she's been dead uh that she hasn't been dead yeah, she as hasn't long. been dead as long so that the you know the evil slash you know whatever has filled the empty void inside her you know whatever spirit uh didn't have a chance that there's more of her left so so yeah that's kind of that's kind of the summary yep um i guess uh one of the one of the things that i wanted to kind of open with was one of the, it would be the quote from the book it's the the soil of a man's heart is stonier lewis a man grows what he can and he tends it because what you buy is what you own so that is a uh, judd crandall the neighbor who uh he tells uh lewis he tells lewis that quote um with the hopes of uh kind of letting him know that you know what they did was kind of a secret and he knows that he, as a you know as a man that he can handle that level of a secret and you know be able to keep it from his family keep it from his wife um you know and uh keep it from his daughter uh and essentially that whatever he does involving that pet cemetery is his he owns it at that point so the cat was his daughter's but the cat becomes his afterwards. So that's that's one of the, the, the most poignant quotes that I I liked in the uh, in the book was the 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 soil of a man's heart is stonier, you know. And sometimes they only say that little little bit, not the whole thing. But they also uh, ownership ownership is a huge huge deal. So when the cat throughout the whole book. And this is what I love. When the cat comes back, it's not just broken, but it's more ferocious than it was before. And it manifests in, you know, killing even more birds. But not just killing them like a regular cat, like mutilating them. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, Lewis Creed, you know, in his thoughts, keeps telling himself, I own those birds. Mm -hmm. You know, I own the cat, so I own what the cat does. Mm Mm-hmm which is killing those birds. And I don't know, that's that's a huge thing. And I, I really like that because that, he does say, you know, the, the, so, the um, you know, the soil of a, the man's, soil heart of a man's heart is stonier. stonier. But he also, the other part of that quote is a huge part of just the book is the ownership. And it's, mm-hmm. it becomes something like, okay, you know, you're a man, you take responsibility for what you do. But then it twists that as in, you know, which is an honorable thing, a great thing. And it twists that as in to something darker. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that struck me as uh, cool that I noticed this time through that I I guess I didn't notice before uh, in a previous read was uh, um, when they're actually walking up to the Micmac burial grounds, uh, they mention how good they feel. It's like they feel... Uh, just their body feels good everything about what they're doing feels good and it's one of those illusions where if it feels good it must be right you know but uh i think lewis he's thinking about it and he's like uh heroin does the same thing where while you're doing it it feels good it feels right but it's killing you you know and so i i like that they uh kind of touched on that with the idea of the pet cemetery in a way is kind of like an addiction. Um, I'd say, I'd say not kind of, I'd say completely. Yeah. yeah. 
and just knowing about it um, is enough to compel you to, you know, let's say, so, you know, someone's pet dies. It's like if you know about it, you're compelled to show them. You know, it's it's one of those secrets, kind of like uh, the ring. You know, the video. It's like I need to share this with someone else. You know, I mean, yeah. not not as a uh, not as brutal as the ring, I guess, but in terms of like you're killing someone else by making them watch it so that you don't have to take it. But it's uh, yeah, you you see, you know what I'm saying. I know, I know what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, but yeah, it's it 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 is addiction. It is addiction filled because when, even though he he only goes to the the burying grounds, how many times? So he goes when Church dies, mm-hmm. goes when Gage dies, and then his wife, and then his wife. That's only three times. Three strikes, you're out. Three strikes, you're out. <laughs> and I I don't know if we mentioned it, but when his wife comes back, she uh, she kills him. So I think it's heavily implied that she is going to kill him. In the in the movie, you hear him scream when she kills him, but I think in the book, doesn't it end with like a you know like a "Honey, I'm home" kind of thing, and you know she reaches for a knife or something like that. Is that? I know you just recently finished it. I, I I finished it like, you know, probably now twenty minutes ago, <laughs> but um, I'm just looking it up. No, now. you 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 go ahead. Um. Uh, oh, I guess one of the things that I did want to talk about, um, and I might as well just do it now, is uh, after I read the book about a week and a half ago, I picked up the movie, and I, I watched the movie real quick, just kind of to see if there were any major differences, and uh, probably one of the biggest differences is in the in the book, um, Judd Crandall's wife is alive, and you know you go through getting to know her and having her die and she has like a kind of debilitating like arthritis arthritis and you know just whatever she ends up having a heart attack and dying at at some point in the book but um in the in the movie she doesn't exist and it's it's a like a neighbor woman who comes to do their laundry who has like stomach pains which is kind of weird i don't i don't understand why they did it that way instead of um just having it be Judd Crandall's wife uh, passing away. But this this neighbor woman, she ends up hanging herself. And so that's kind of, you know, the little girl is asking about death because the lady who came to do their laundry killed herself, you know. And so she hears adults talking about that. And so she has a lot of questions about death. But that's really the only big difference between the book and the movie content-wise. Um, aside from the book... Uh, with a lot of Stephen King uh, books that are adapted into movies and they just don't quite live up to the uh, the terror, the horror, you know. I think it's mostly because Stephen King tends to write very uh, introspectively. His characters are, uh, it's all in their head. You know, you're hearing their thoughts as they think them. And movies don't generally do that without a narrator, you know. So I think that's really the main difference between the movie and the book otherwise the movie's pretty scary like uh you know it's it's cheesy at times and i think uh the music uh, and and king's one of the characters yeah (laughs) he's the he's uh the the reverend uh, he's the reverend at the neighbor's funeral yeah so not the boy's funeral but the the neighbor lady who hangs herself and they go to her funeral but but yeah, um, they're actually remaking the movie, um, and it's gonna have. I heard about that. Uh, John Lithgow is going to be Judd Crandall, so Third Rock from the Sun yep. dad, right? He's he's great in everything he's been in since Third Rock from the Sun. I love Third Rock from the Sun too. Um, the guy who plays John Connor from Terminator Genesis. I don't know the actor's name, and I could look it up. But is I'm he gonna be gonna Lewis? He's he's Lewis Creed. You know, whatever. He's just a a dude. And then uh, just some kids and whatever. I think the only major actor besides the guy who plays Lewis Creed that I don't know his name is Judd Crandall. So yeah, yeah. But I'm looking forward to this uh, resurgence in uh, Stephen King popularity since uh, the It movie came out. I think that really kind of pushed him forward in pop culture. He got a couple Netflix movies as well for other things. But yeah. Well, I think the quality of movies and everything is going up. Yeah. To catch up to 
the quality of the books because a lot of it is in a lot of the horror is psychological it's not necessarily monsters jumping out and scaring the living crap out of you Mm -hmm. it's it's psychological like in this in this book like i said you only he only goes there three times he only goes to the micmac burying grounds three times and the scare really scary part happens at the end where his son is killing you know judd crandall and his wife that's the scary part and that like so i we listen to audiobooks and so it was really only the last what two hours yeah, hour it happens so fast right at the end of the book yeah, yeah it's one thing after another and so that's what i like about the stephen king books and i like about this one is it's very it's in your head and yeah. it's scary as a parent reading this book yeah i think the first time i read this book uh my youngest daughter or my oldest daughter was i she was the only one i had and she was maybe like two years old so she was basically gage's age And when I read this book, I actually had to quit reading it because I started to kind of have like a little bit of an anxiety attack uh, when it came to, uh, you know, the Gage's death and the funeral and the way that Lewis is thinking, like following his train of thoughts as he starts to think more and more about the acceptance of death. And then he starts to kind of lean into the pet cemetery and justify how he could make it work you know the logistics of digging up his son uh what he would need to do the planning getting his wife and daughter sent back to chicago to her family so that he can do all these things in secret you know again his his stony you know all all of his secrets that he's gonna keep you know his in his stony heart you know so um but yeah i i I had to quit reading it because i kind of hit a little too close for to home for me and uh i've i've only read this book i think three times now actually maybe this was yeah this was my third time and uh, i i have a a boy right now who's four years old and you know again about the same age thinking thinking through just all the kids and as a parent you know one of the scariest things is the road out in front of your house You know, I mean, you know, anywhere a road, but the one out in front of your house where you're supposed to feel the safest, you know, and yeah. (laughs) And every kid, but especially boys, it seems like, because I have three boys, every kid loves the run away from mom and dad game. Yep. And come back here. It's always (laughs) always the road. There's a magnetic field around it. Every kid is sucked right into it. Um, I, I actually, the first two times I read it, the first time I read it, did not have kids the second time i read it i did and i had a boy and there is a huge difference you know constant listener for for you guys out there if you don't have a kid you know try your best to imagine it but someday if you do have a kid read read this book when they're about two years old yeah read it (laughs) and the horror of it is it it's tenfold it it increases so much more because all you can do is imagine it and because it's happened every parent goes through that moment where they're running after their kid and their kids you know laughing their head off having the greatest time of their life yeah running (laughs) right into danger because you know kids have crap for brains until they're well i don't don't know when that ever goes away (laughs) (laughs) i've still got some crap up there there, there's feces (laughs) knocking around in the noggin but that's that's what I think the biggest thing is the scariest thing. So, and this time through, uh, you know, again knowing what's going to happen in the book, um, knowing what's going to happen in the story, uh, it makes the death hit so much harder. Um, was the uh, the day before it happened? It, in in the book, Lewis Creed mentions that it's the last day he remembers being happy. Yep. And it's a day where it's just him and Gage, and they get a kite, and they they go flying out in their, you know, the field in their backyard, and they're just having the time of their life, you know, it's like the, I love you, son, I love you, dad, you know, it's like, just one of those precious moments, and seeing it played out in the book, right, you know, literally the chapter before, uh, you know, the funeral, is really really hard like this time through i was just like you know 
it, it's it's almost like when you know in a movie that you know your favorite character is gonna die or something and you're just you're just a not you know your stomach is in knots and you're just like you want to enjoy it and you want to change the outcome you want to reach right in the book and just be like you know stay away from the road keep your kid away yep. from the road and yeah it 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 hits hard every single time that this happens so and yeah having that moment of pure joy and pure happiness right before the you know the worst thing in the entire world is uh it's poignant yeah very very brutal so <laughs> and i oh oh there's there's so much so it's it says a lot about the book that we've we've gone back to it and and, and it says a lot about how well he writes that when i read it i've i've read it probably 5 times now and every time i read it i keep thinking okay this is the time where gage isn't going to die where he's going to jump just long enough cuz you know he jumps and it's like a, a a wide receiver jumping for the football. Yeah, I think he says his fingers brush the back of his yeah. jacket, of Gage's jacket, to pull him from the road. But he, it's just just enough that he touches and doesn't make it. Yeah, but every time I read it, I keep thinking, this is the time, it's going to change, I'm going to read it, he'll catch Gage, and happily ever after happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it says something about the writing that... He can set me up emotionally like that, that my hopes get that far up thinking things are going to turn out okay, and then they don't. It's like, think think about uh, Star Wars A New Hope. Do you ever get sad that Obi-Wan Kenobi dies? Like, he just dies, you know. He it, It's just something that happens. Every time I watch that movie, I don't think to myself... Um, Oh man, I wish what would have happened in the story if Obi Wan lived. You know, I don't ever think that. I don't no. ever feel like I could reach into the story and change it. But yeah, Stephen King actually has several of these uh, throughout all of his writing that uh, just totally just sucker punch you in the gut because he creates this uh, almost this illusion of control you know over the character that you are there with the character you're you're reading his thoughts you know and you you feel like you could change it and you just can't yeah you feel like you could just reach in (laughs) you know run a little faster than lewis and just grab gage right before save his life and you know nothing nothing has to happen yeah that's how i feel every single time (laughs) you know what i really liked I don't know if I told you this, but I really liked the the reversal of Lewis Creed and his wife. So during the whole thing, uh, Rachel, she is just terrified of death. It is it's not something they talk about in her family. At one point, Lewis Lewis is thinking about it. And he's like, oh, she has never actually been to a funeral. You know, since since we've been married and him as a doctor, you know, he's had many opportunities to go to funeral funerals, but something happens every single time. She's she's either sick or she has to go somewhere or something happens. And so she is terrified of death. And Lewis is a doctor, obviously accepts death Mm -hmm. as just part of life, part of life. Yeah. But then towards the end with the you know, with him taking church and then Gage, and then Rachel, he's the one, you know, they reverse it. She actually comes to accept Gage's death more readily, you know, than Lewis. And she start. you can see it, her start to heal from the death because she wants, you know, her family around. She's like, Lewis, I don't want to go visit my parents. I want you with me because we need to be together as a family. Mm-hmm. We need to, you know, we need to come closer. She's going through that, but Lewis... At this point, he is not accepting death as mm-hmm. a part of life. He he sees it as you know something that can be reversed uh, erroneously with the the Micmac grounds. And so I thought that was I, I don't know I really like that reversal 
uh, just because it kind of shows uh, what a let's say let's compare the cemetery to drugs shows what a healthy mind uh, what drugs you know like a, a something that dangerous and that mind altering can completely change you know it's like everybody knows somebody who's gotten like crazy into drugs or alcohol or something like that and just they're like you're like they're completely a different person now and their, their ability to to make good decisions mm-hmm. goes out the window yeah and especially good in the book the seeing his thought process uh from gage's death onward i mean from the second he goes to the micmac burial ground onward you kind of see that he then now has to uh, tend that secret, you know? And uh, you you see the way that he's laying things out in his mind to justify how he's going to, you know, why it's okay, you know? No. So, yeah. That's, oh, it's, uh, a, it's a cool reversal. It's, I don't know. I really, I really like yeah, it. I, You're going to say something? No, that's true. No, there, there was another quote, and uh, it was, you know, obviously sometimes dead is better. That's, it's uh, one of the the Judd Crandall quotes. You know, sometime dead is better. You know, it's, oh, is that is that your New England? I I, I guess. <laughs> or your Maine? <laughs> uh, uh, a lot a lot of animals get used up in that road. Oh, up well, in that road. Oh well, you you listen to the the newer <laughs> audio book. I listen to the old garbage one. The 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 guy who plays Judd Crandall in the movie is the guy who plays Herman Munster from the the old Munster show. Okay. Um and his his accent is so good. Like his characterization of Judd Crandall is really really good. I'm looking forward to uh what's his name? Uh John Lithgow doing it. Yeah. But um yeah, the way the way he like talks and says Rody. I mean, he's a very uh uh char- uh stereotypical Stephen King side character. Yeah. You know, he usually has these kind of main, you know, bumpkin type guys who, you know, have funny sayings like the sometimes I'll smile and kiss a pig, you know, yep. that kind of stuff. Stuff that's very regional, but uh, I've never been to Maine, but I feel like I've dealt with a lot of those characters just because I've read so many Stephen King books. But anyways, <laughs> although we've tried convincing our wives that we should move to Maine, but oh, yeah. They don't like that idea too much. Ah, it's too cold for Celeste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they know that the only reason we're moving there no, is to... I think it was a couple months back, there was a an article online I saw saying that, like, it was houses for sale on the street that Stephen King lives. And it was just a listing of several houses and how much they cost just along the street that he lives in Maine. And... uh I mean, you know, there was some pretty affordable stuff, you know, in like the 200s range or so. Oh, my god! That gosh. like you can realistically kind of think, oh, I could live on the same street as Stephen King. My kids could trick or treat his house on Halloween. His Dude, he's probably got one of the coolest Halloween houses. Have you ever seen it? Yeah. It's got that the yeah, gate with it. like the spiders and the bats and it. It looks it looks like a, you know, Bates Motel or the Bates house, the Munster house. It's kind of just that horror house. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> oh, the king. But here so here's that that quote we were talking about earlier. So I think it I think it's up to up to um you yeah, know Yeah, up to the reader. Up to, to the reader to decide whether or not she kills him. It's it's really short. Should I just read yeah, the go for it. Okay. So here's the epilogue. <clears throat> the police came late that afternoon. They asked questions, but voiced no suspicions. The ashes were still hot. They had not yet been raked. Lewis answered their questions. They seemed satisfied. They spoke outside, and he wore a hat. That was good. If they had seen his gray hair, they might have asked more questions. That would have been bad. He wore his gardening gloves, and that was good, too. His hands were bloody and ruined. He played solitaire that night until long after midnight. He was just dealing a fresh hand when he heard the back door open. What you buy is what you own, and sooner or later, what you own will come back to you, Lewis Creep thought. He did not turn around, but only looked at his cards as the slow, gritting footsteps approached. He saw the Queen of Spades. He put his hand on it. The steps ended directly behind him. Silence. 
A cold hand fell on Lewis's shoulder. Rachel's voice was grating, full of dirt. Darling, it said. And so, Darling. So I, I think I think it's up to the reader. I think it's up to interpretation. I mean, I could see her putting his hand, you know, and then mm-hmm. strangling him, but Yeah. You, you don't know. Yeah, straight straight up in the movie, she gra- they you know, they start kissing and she's all gory and nasty from uh you know, getting cut up and killed and whatever. And uh yeah, she grabs a knife from the the knife block as they're like making out all bloody and gross. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty gross. The 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 wife is uh she's one of the Star Trek next generation uh characters. I can't remember who she is, but yeah. yeah. Nothing, nothing like making out with a, a bloody zombie. Bloody mess. Delicious. Delicious. Oh, so one thing that that's kind of interesting. I don't know if you thought much about it, but they talk about the Wendigo. The Wendigo, yeah. The Wendigo, yeah. Um, I mean, it's that's a creature, you know, from Native American mythology that's uh, created when some like somebody is uh, forced onto cannibalism. Like they, they turn to cannibalism, not forced. But somebody who turns to cannibalism to survive and develops a taste for it and, you know, every bit that they eat, they lose more and more of their soul and they become this uh, mythological creature, kind of like a werewolf. Yeah. Uh, they mention the Wendigo in, uh, you know, on the way to the Micmac burial grounds, they hear all sorts of, you know, nasty laughing. and. Uh, but they do actually see it. Do, so do they see it? They see it. Mm-hmm. They, they well, I mean, it's not it's not a full out description. Yeah, but they do mention the yellow eyes, and it's kind of a towering figure. Mm-hmm. If, if I remember, you know, what constant listener, you want to look it up, feel free to, you know, to check us on this. But I remember, if I remember correctly, you see the yellow eyes, and you see kind of a hulking figure. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a big swamp monster or yeah, something. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah, I'm and, thinking. And so I don't know if, if there's different kind of Wendigo, you know, Wendigo. Uh, I don't know if there's different kinds. Because the one in this book, it doesn't do any cannibalism. It doesn't do any... I, I don't know if you knew anything about them before. I, I don't know. Beforehand. I don't know a single thing. Maybe that's something we need to revisit. Yeah, but yeah. But I, I think it's almost like the personification. Just uh This is just me. Mm-hmm. The personification of the Micmac bur- burial grounds, mm-hmm. because it seems so throughout the whole book, it's not just like like we said that Lewis Creed was compelled, yeah, to go there, just like Judd Crandall was compelled to take Lewis there, yeah, you know, to bury Church, and it seems like when they get to you know when they're on the way to the burial grounds, they, they it's like they go into a different realm, mm-hmm. a different different something. It's they not the same through... reality. And tying it into a, again, so something that we're going to do on this podcast is uh, sometimes we'll tie things in with other books. Stephen King is known for tying his books, characters, locations, themes, uh, all together. So uh, one of the things that we are going to do on this podcast from time to time is tie uh, events, characters, places, you know, whatever any connections that we can make between Stephen King books to each other, uh, you know, we'll point those out if we have them. Um, one of the ones in here is that that kind of walk through the Micmac burial grounds, the swamp on the way. It kind of feels like a, you know, a thin place, you know, kind of that thinny. Uh, in in the Dark Tower series, there's these uh, thinnies that it's kind of like a thin. Where reality reality, reality is, is thin. If you think of it as a cloth. You know, regular or, reality or is a nice ball. quilt. Is a nice quilt or a leather ball? Yeah, a leather ball where it's scuffed almost, but it's still intact as a ball. It still holds air. But there's like but one there's, part that's yeah. just thin enough to where you can see it bulging out. Yeah. So that's what a thinny is. Yeah, and sometimes creatures, uh, you know, kind of cross over from other dimensions. Uh, you know, like other different different uh, levels of the tower. You know, different. Uh, yeah, so there, it's possible that the uh, the swamp he walks through on the way to the Micmac burial grounds kind of is a thinny. So just one of those one of those things. There's not many Dark Tower connections in this, but uh, I, I'd say that's probably the most solid one. one. Uh, with with the Wendigo, um, I actually thought of it while you were talking about it. Is I was saying, you know, there's no cannibalism, 
But if you think about the Micmac burial grounds, you're giving up this hunk of meat and you're putting it into the ground. And in a way, the, the Micmac burial grounds itself and the personification, what you said, uh, becomes a cannibal. You know, yeah, and is you know, so maybe that's that's kind of the connection there that I was kind of missing, is where you know how does cannibalism, uh, because cannibalism is tied with the Wendigo. How does that tie into the story? Anyway, it's just something I thought of while you were saying it. No, it's true, it's true. So when I when I read this this last time, I haven't read it in a while. It's probably been what three years, two years for me. Mm-hmm. Um. And when I read it this last time, I didn't realize how much possession played a factor, you know? Because mm-hmm. when, when Lewis, when he is going, when he's going through everything, he says at so many points that, you know, I wish someone would kind of stop me, is in, he can think normal, like a normal human being, but it's not, he's not really in control of what he's doing. It's more than just compelling Mm -hmm. at certain points in the book it's like someone has taken possession of him almost and made him do it Mm -hmm. and i think they you know he opened that door with the desire Mm -hmm. to bring his kid back and then once he opened it enough something came in and is kind of pushing him forward and then possession you know king takes that that idea of possession even further when gage and you know his wife come back and they're 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 not they're not complete souls they what, are what, they what are do you think broken. his wife's name is huh rachel 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 is it, is it rachel 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 creed yeah because i'm like i don't remember what her name is i think the daughter's name is elizabeth ellie ellie but i think it's elizabeth so i think oh for ellie, yeah yeah but I, I couldn't remember the wife's name and we kept calling her his wife and i'm like oh i don't remember her name <laughs> well i remembered um, uh, one, one thing that we haven't talked about at all is we haven't talked about, uh, Victor Pascal. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We didn't even mention him on the, uh, the summary. But oh my gosh. Yeah. He's a huge factor. Yeah. So he's huge. It, it's, it's so sad because it's so fruitless. Anyways, I'll, I'll explain real quick. So, uh, on his first day of being, uh, on the college, you know, college, the uh, direct, doctor, uh, the physician, the physician, you know, uh, a kid gets hit by a car a kid out jogging with some friends he gets hit and his head gets busted open and he's pretty much dead right there he gets brought in and he's bleeding everywhere but while he's dying he turns to lewis and he you know mentions something about the pet cemetery and the man's heart being stonier and whatever i can't remember exactly what he says but he kind of is talking to lewis saying things that he shouldn't know right before he dies and then he dies well he does mention he does call lewis by his name yeah he calls him by his name yeah and they've never met before then and so victor although he's like this bloody figure throughout the book he's almost like this not i don't want to say guardian angel he's he's a potential guardian angel he's trying so hard but you know what uh, it's all it's all pretty fruitless. He ends up causing more problems than uh, he fixes. You know, the, but he does try. He does try and he, he warn comes. He comes Lewis. to Lewis in his dream and tells him to stay away from the pet cemetery before he buries Church. He's just like, don't go past the, uh, you know, don't go past the 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 deadfalls. Is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. The, the tree. There's some trees that are kind of blocking the way. A natural barricade. Um, and then uh, later he. Oh yeah, and then Lewis wakes up and his feet are all muddy. Yeah. So it's like it was a dream, but it wasn't a dream. He really went out there, and then the and then after Lewis or after Victor uh, fails with Lewis because Lewis goes to the pet cemetery, the Micmac burial ground. Anyways, he starts to appear to the daughter and give advice and kind of like the, you know, I, I don't even remember exactly what he does, but. No, he just Besides he just tries. He just tries. Yeah, yeah, he gives her bad dreams, but he's really trying hard, failing, completely failing, because he's freaking the little girl out. But he's trying hard to like warn her that you know yeah, her dad's going to do something it's really, irreversible. It's really sad because the the Vic, uh, Lewis Creed he knows the whole time that his daughter is having these prophetic dreams that he's having these prophetic dreams, and then his daughter is, and it's like I had a dream that. 
you know, daddy did this. I had a dream that cat, the cat died and, you know, and he, just everything that, uh, he's warning, uh, the daughter about and the daughter's telling the dad and the parents it's all true. And they just choose to straight up ignore it. It's pretty sad. Well, he, he does. What, yeah. What I, what I, and he it's, ignores at it. At that point, but it's, it's, it's just a huge red flag. That's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be messing with these forces out, you know? beyond comprehension and beyond reality you know yeah but he does it anyways but it, but the thing is is every single step he takes into his you know down downward spiral of madness and terrible things happening every single step is completely logical mm-hmm. like when i when i reread it this time i was like would i do this and i could answer yes it's like for would, most of the things i would probably yeah like if i could <laughs> like would i bring my kid back knowing what he knew at the time that you know there's a chance that he could come back completely fine and even though he had those sinking feelings in his gut like mm-hmm. nope this is bad turn away like each step i could say yeah i'd, I'd probably take that step and that's what's scary that's the scariest that's part that's the scary the part is because Especially as a father, as a as a man with a stony heart. Yep. It's like we 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 know that certain avenues of thought can lead to some scary places, you know. Yeah. So. And that's that's what I love. It's because you get you get reading it and you think, oh my gosh, I I would make all these horrible decisions given the right circumstances, and I think <laughs> a lot of us, a lot of us would, and that's that's what makes it scary too. Yeah. Oh, I I agree. <laughs> As we would all take, you know, we'd all take our yeah. a little dip in the void and so, not come out, maybe. So Stephen King, he actually, you know, I'm not gonna bother looking it up, but in the introduction to the most recent uh, release of his book, there's a not a prologue, but a, an introduction that he writes, where he mentions that this book almost wasn't even published. He. Uh, I guess he wrote it in, you know, kind of based on his own personal experience. He actually moved to an area in Maine early on in his career. Uh, and he was going to be a, a t- like a, a writer in residence. like a So he wasn't the doctor. He was a writer. And uh, he lived in this house that had a really busy street with all the big trucks. You know, him and his family were out having a picnic one day and... Uh, I, th- I can't remember it was, it was Owen. Owen it was Owen Owen goes running towards the road and he ah uh, you know runs and he actually caught him so he lives the uh the what if fantasy of if you caught your kid you know that and then he, here he is he wrote a book about it about how scary you know the the horror that could have happened you know and uh yeah he almost didn't didn't publish it because he thought maybe he went too far I don't know if in regards to just, you know, the subject matter with the kid and, you know, the evil and all that. But uh, his wife, actually, uh, Tabitha, she encouraged him to publish it. Well, not at, not so. at first. Yeah. So at first, I know Tabitha that, I think it was... and Peter Straub mm-hmm, both said, ahead. this is way too freaking dark. This is, <laughs> this is terrifying, you know. It's, this this is, is too dark and gloomy. There's no happiness. And, and you know king's books this, a lot of them this don't one have actually, happiness but this, this one, one is dark this one reminded me a lot of thinner by the way which is a rick richard bachman yeah but it's stephen king uh just in that it's just so dark yeah just incredibly dark and so this this book almost felt like a bachman book in some ways yeah. anyways you continue no no you're fine you're fine there's no there's no happiness in this one it's like you start out with the light being turned on full bright and then it goes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until the end. There's no dark, and then you get eaten. No, yep. but it's it is really sad to see this Victor Pascal just completely fail. By the way, like just <laughs> what happens when guardian angels suck? Yeah, what happens when they just totally blow it? Yeah. <laughs> no, but so he, um, Peter Straub and Tabitha, did not. You know. They wasn't said it, it was too dark. Wasn't it like a contract thing? Yeah, and so Stephen King was like, "I need, I need another book. I, I guess to fulfill a contract, something." He need, he's like, "I need another book," and he had this one already, and so he in one of his books, in one of the Dark Tower books, it 
uh, an epilogue or just an after he kind of writes a he writes a little bit about pet cemetery and how he was like i'm going to you know the readers they're, they're just going to crucify me they're going <laughs> to kill me for this book it's like it's like the, again the equivalent of if you make a movie and you kill the dog yeah it's like oh man or you yeah you kill the kid you kill the dog it's like he broke the rules <laughs> but surprisingly it did really well mm-hmm. um i guess there's a, you know more sickos like us who like <laughs> who like it <laughs> But you know we 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 love the we love the book. Um, it's it's good to read a, a tragedy. I don't I don't know why both of us mm-hmm. both of us feel it's like a satisfying it's, ending, even though it's a very scary ending. Yeah. So sometimes when everything you know happy ending everything wraps up, sometimes I feel like you don't learn as much about life. Like, uh, there's not a lot you can take away from a story that everybody wins and everybody, you know, like, let's say Harry Potter, for instance. Yeah, there's a lot of good life lessons in that series, but it's just, uh, you know, it's just such a happy ending. Everything is so neat and, you know, whatever at the end. It's like this book is more of a cautionary tale. And when, when a story can be a tragedy, it's, it's... It's easier to take someone's advice. Like, if you see a road sign, beware of this path. It's like, oh, that's a cautionary uh, sign. I'm going to beware. You read a story like this, it's it's kind of the beware of, you know, man's stony heart and what you could accidentally cultivate, yeah. you know? It's like, if you're not careful, one step at a time, you can end up in that Micmac burying ground yourself, Yeah, you know? doing something that you could would never in your normal mind be doing you know but yeah. baby steps took you there yeah so Some, something so yeah, something that you can't come back from so in terms of the the tragedies that's kind of one of my favorite things about king and his tragic stories is you learn some of the best lessons from them you know it's a very clean cut be careful of this <laughs> uh, kind of on the same levels as um mary shelley's frankenstein yeah yeah which similar sim- very very similar you know reanimation um resurrection whatnot mm-hmm. very similar just you, you just don't you don't go certain places you don't bring bring people back from the dead not the best not the best idea doesn't turn out very good in most cases hello this is magnus in the future uh recording a little end cap for this episode turns out we just stopped talking and didn't really say goodbye um just for sake of time uh, i figured record something here just to let you guys know that uh our next episode will be on the jaunt which can be found in the short story collection skeleton crew so thanks for tuning in and listening and uh always remember there are other worlds than these (laughs) 